Good afternoon. My name is Jana Meyer, and I'm an Associate Curator of Collections at the Filson Historical Society. Thank you so much for joining us virtually this afternoon. During the lecture, please post your questions in the chat and we will share them as time permits. Thank you again for joining us for Old Louisville, Community Life in a Preservation District. This program is sponsored by the American Institute of Architects, Central Kentucky Chapter, and the University of Kentucky College of Design. Before we begin, um, I have a message from Sanaya Casa to share. She says, as the president of the American Institute of Architects, Central Kentucky Chapter, I want to thank everyone in attendance for your interest in the creative work and legacy of our architect members. Today's lecture is the outcome of an important partnership that helps our creative work endure long after any individual career comes to an end and supports our mission to bring lasting value to the communities that we serve. This fellowship, which was funded by a partnership between the AIA, the Filson, and the University of Kentucky College of Design, is focused on historical research of Louisville's built environment. This is essential in maintaining Louisville's rich history of architectural excellence. The AIA is grateful for the opportunity to work with the Filson Fellow to archive drawings of award-winning projects by Louisville architects and to make architectural knowledge more accessible to the public at large. The built environment is the outward statement of our cultural identity, and this partnership demonstrates that our community is committed to maintaining a beautiful and viable community for all. I want to thank Catherine Shadowin for her commitment to architectural history and for conducting the research that we will hear about today. Her research is a valuable research source for the city of Louisville and for the architectural profession. It will help us preserve our architectural heritage, to educate the public about architecture, and to inspire future generations of architects. On a housekeeping note, we request that all AIA members in attendance take a moment to now type your AIA number into the chat so we can make sure that you get the HSW credit for attending today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Catherine Shadowin is a recent graduate from the University of Kentucky where she obtained her BFA in interior design and her undergraduate certificate of historic preservation. With a passion for historic preservation and community well-being, she has focused her research on the impacts they have on one another and efforts to mitigate the negative effects. Please join me in welcoming Katherine Shadowin. Hello, everyone. Like Jana said, I'm Katherine Shadowin. Um, I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about Old Louisville and the Historic Preservation District, uh, as well as the community within it. Um, to start off, I just want to give a little recap of the other work that I've done this summer, thanks to the partnership between the Filson and the AIA um, CKC. So to start my summer, I began by cataloging the Nevin and Morgan Architects Collection and also had the opportunity to work with some work by George Herbert Gray and William Aerosmith, as well as do um, work with the digital digitized collections of Jasper Ward and Grossman Chapman Architects. Um, and as many of these buildings and sites have seen decay or destruction, this uh, process has really shown me the importance of archival activity, activities for preserving these architects' legacies. Um, they have a very strong influence on the built environment in Louisville and the work that I've been able to do through the Filson and with these partnerships of the AIA and the UK College of Design. Um, we're able to preserve their legacies and, you know, allow future architects to see the beautiful work that they um, they created, even if it no longer stands. Um, additionally, um, I would like to just give a thank you to the um, the Filson and the AIA CKC, as well as the UK College of Design, for allowing me to commit these or er, um, have this research opportunity. Um, as well as a special thank you to Jana Meyer, my supervisor, for all of her guidance throughout this fellowship. 
Um, as we'll, as it moving forward, I will go ahead and share my presentation and get started. Okay, so Louisville, Old Louisville is a community um, that is a historic preservation district within the center of Louisville, um, just south of downtown. So it was a neighborhood that was erected by wealth and has been sustained by community. So it was originally started in the late, mid to late 1800s by super wealthy families in Louisville that are still common names that we hear today, such as the Speeds, Browns, the um, Owsleys, and many others that built these beautiful mansions. Um, the one you see in the picture is the Conrad Caldwell House. Um, it is now a museum for viewing. And a lot of these houses are beautiful mansions that took lots of money, especially at the time, to build. Um, most of them were made of, with gas appliances and have beautiful fixtures wonderful um, stay in class and many other architecturally significant features. But soon after they're um, built, soon after they were built, they these families kind of started to move out as electricity kind of came into play. Um, the homes became dated and they started to decay because the families were no longer living in them. And that's how community has really sustained this neighborhood because without the um, organizations within these houses would have just continued to decay and they've seen a high level of preservation since the early 70s. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the area, I just wanted to give a brief history of Old Louisville. Um, so it was originally named the Southern Extension and began, began at this area of Lower Broadway um, or below Broadway. So this blue area is what Google now defines as Old Louisville. Um, and this green area is the defined historic preservation district of the 1974 preservation designation. Um, so it was originally known as the Southern Extension as it was the first suburb of Louisville. Um, none of these areas around had been developed yet, but as it began, continued to develop, it, the Southern Extension didn't really make any sense. Um, people kind of started giving it other surnames and, and was kind of, didn't have a specific designation of name until June 4th, 1961, when Dr. Phillips at the University of Louisville um, gave it the name Old Louisville because, or through the Courier Journal um, in an article by Douglas Nunn, who has done a lot of work in preserving um, the history of Old Louisville and providing a lot of um, exposure to the preservation activists of Old Louisville in the early or late 60s, early 70s. So what kind of brought attention to Old Louisville was the Southern Exposition. After the initial development, um, this industrial mercantile show was um, created on the lower part of Central Park and what is now known as St. James Court. And it is um, it was an opportunity for innovators to show off um, their inventions. So we saw a lot of um, work with electricity and machinery. Um, and this included the electric light bulb by Thomas Edison. So this kind of brought a lot of industry to Louisville as well as just um, interest in the area brought attention to these large mansions um, and really drew people into the area. The exposition didn't last very long. Um, it was closed in 1897 and the land was divided into what is now known as St. James Court after it was purchased by W.H. Slaughter. So these courts, um, there are several walking courts throughout 
um, Old Louisville. And St. James Court is not a walking court, but it is probably one of the most significant courts or well-known courts in the area. Um, it features this beautiful fountain that can be seen in the picture to the right. And um, it was really a way for community to get brought together. So, um, and along this area, so William H. Slaughter had set up requirements that the lots or the homes had to be at least $7,000, which was a pretty significant amount for the time. And they all had to be made of brick. So most of the houses on the court are single family homes and they're immaculate mansions, beautiful um, and very well preserved. There is one exception to this and it's a, an apartment complex that was built five stories tall and all of the neighbors were very disgruntled at this, but it did meet the requirements that were needed for, um, for the $7,000 and being made of brick. Unfortunately, this caught fire and it's now a three-story house and, um, and it actually fits into the neighborhood a bit more and many of the neighbors were very pleased by, by this fire, although it was somewhat tragic. Um, some of the other walking courts that you can see listed here are Belgravia Court, which is at the end of St. James Court and is um, a beautiful display of, um, of landscaping and uh, mansions. Um, Fountain Court is also off of St. James Court and is one of the first courts, walking courts of the area. Floral Terrace is off of Central Park. Um, Avery Court is in the south end of the Old Louisville and Auerbacher Court is on the um, east end. So all of these have their different um, aspects to them and draw a very significant community life. Because of the walking courts, a lot of these neighbors feel very connected to each other and have the opportunity to really um, build those relationships that you don't really see in neighborhoods today. Um, this is kind of something that's unique about Old Louisville and um, something that is kind of um, shows that the architectural development and the built environment really does have an impact on community because without these walking courts, um, there wouldn't really be anything different about Louisville than many of the other historic districts in the nation. Um, but with this and the desire to, um, you know, keep hold to the, that community, the Neighborhood has really worked together to preserve that those efforts and um, keep them maintained. A little more information about how these communities work together has to do with the fountain you see. So as you can see in the picture, there are some wooden posts that are holding up the upper end of the fountain. And this is just one of the times that the fountain had needed repairs. Um, but it wasn't city funded. So people of St. James Court and then the surrounding neighborhood often came together to make um, amendments to the fountain. Additionally, the, um, the banister that you see there was not original to the fountain. Um, it originally had no railing. Um, and soon after it was constructed, constructed it, there was a child that ended up drowning in it because children would often play in it and there was no way to prevent them um, from getting into it without any kind of banister. So quickly after this, they made a makeshift solution and um, used some barbed wire and some post to make a, a fence. Um, but soon after the, um, the, banister that you see there um, was salvaged from the Old Strand Theater in downtown Louisville um, that was on their balconies in there and was transformed into a railing for St. James Court. Um, additionally, the neighbors had to pull together money to keep it from sinking into the ground. It was started falling and um, they had to pump in more concrete underneath. Um, I don't remember the exact story of the poles in the picture above, but I'm sure it was another structural issue that was then amended because um, it still stands today. It's still a running fountain and it's a beautiful um, ornament for the court. 
Another sparkling aspect of the old Louisville neighborhood is Central Park. Um, and the park was originally not public. It was a part of the DuPont family estate. So they began to open the public to the land for a fee or the land to the public for a fee. Um, but after some financial troubles, they made a deal with the city to make the park uh, a public free park. Um, and then in 1904, the city was fully purchased the land and decided to have the park designed by, by um, famous art, landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, this architect, landscape architect did work on Central Park in New York, as well as um, work in the Capitol, and um, if you're familiar with the Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina. A lot of very grand um, projects have his name on them, as well as many of the parks within Louisville. Um, and this park still today holds a lot of the community life for the area. So um, many people mentioned Shakespeare in the park, um, which is began in 1962 as we know it today. But originally Shakespeare, the first Shakespeare play was conducted in the park in 1895, just shortly after the neighborhood was um, pulled together. And so it kind of shows that this communal um, gathering area has been a vital part of the community life for since its um, beginning. So the path to preservation, <clears throat> excuse me, the path to preservation has kind of seen a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, so in the early development, as I have told you, it was developed by very wealthy um, Louisville urbanites and was named the Southern Extension. So obviously there wasn't much preservation in the beginning because it was just, you know, starting to become what it is now or what it was then. Um, and then in the Depression era, kind of 1900s through the 1930s, um, as well as there was economic trials that kind of caused people to move away, um, as well as the issues with changing from gas to electric, especially when electric appliances came out. Um, that became it made it more difficult to modernize these historic buildings that already were seeing the, their date, even though they hadn't been around super long. Additionally, there were several floods that um, kind of sped up this process of removing people from the area. Um, and additionally, in the Depression era, a lot of these mansions were began to be divided into apartment complexes because the families that owned the mansions wanted to stay there for potentially, but they couldn't afford to maintain the mansion with no other form of income. So they would divide their bedrooms and other areas of the house into smaller apartments. So the idea of modernity kind of changed the um, what happened in design throughout the United States and really throughout the world. Um, and we kind of see that in old Louisville. So, so before the Preservation Act, a lot of homes were getting torn down and replaced with um, modernized buildings, such as like the Central Park Lofts, which are just off the corner of the Filson Historical Society. Um, and we see many other buildings that are apartment complexes and larger buildings in the area that don't quite fit in with this mansion style, um, which is kind of an interesting aspect to the area because a lot of times these days, those buildings are now being torn down. Um, but to be considered historic, it has to be at least 50 years old. Well, these buildings are now 50 years old and have been preserved since their beginning because shortly after they were built, the preservation district came into the area to prevent more of these historic 1800s mansions from being torn down. So the grassroots movement of preservation in the area really stuck through in 1974 when it was allowed to um, fully make that preservation designation. It was the first preservation district in Louisville and really set a tone for the rest of Louisville and um, pushed those other areas to um, preserve their neighborhoods and really get behind this preservation idea.
Um, and then with taking from that, post-preservation has been a big part of um, the preservation of the area because just because you write it on paper and um, put it in a historic landmark district doesn't really mean that anybody's going to follow those um, suggestions. So you really have to have the community and the grassroots movement behind it continuously um, to really preserve those buildings. Otherwise, I mean, the city could come in and mandate things, but you really have to have someone there that's watching to see what's happening and really um, preserve those, those houses and the community within um, and push for the city to do its part. So that has been a big part of what has been done um, since the preservation designation in 1974. So as a big part of my research this summer, I committed a community survey um, throughout Old Louisville, and I got 31 um, responses from residents within Old Louisville. Um, so as, you, as I said before, this blue area is the area that Google considers Old Louisville. Um, and luckily all of my respondents were in the Old Louisville Historic District. Um, and then each of these blue dots is the location of a resident's home. Um, as you can see a lot in the Floral Terrace area, this down here would be Belgravia Court and St. James Court and Floral or um, Fountain Court. Um, so kind of these heavier community areas are where I saw a majority of my responses, but also throughout the neighborhood. I mean, the whole um, neighborhood has, I mean, there are, I believe, 12 community organizations that are preservation organizations in the district that work together to um, bring together uh, these communities. So. Um, so the results of the community survey were quite interesting. Um, so of the responses, 87% of them felt that the preservation of historic architecture aided in the preservation of the community life. And this really goes to show that those walking courts and those um, large pedways that um, were developed for the promenades back in the 1800s are really important to the community. And um, living within historic buildings is important to the people that live here. Um, and it shows that it is important to them that um, these structures be maintained that um, to preserve their, their relationships within their community and that working together really does help them maintain those relationships. Because if you're both, or if you're working together to save a building that it, neither of you all have, a true interest or a true um, tie to, except for other than that it's your, it's in your neighborhood, um, that really does develop a relationship and um, create a bond and community. Um, a lot of the residents that responded felt that they were connected to the history, although they didn't live there for multi-generations. I did have one respondent that was a multi-generational um, um, community member. And then um, several people felt they were uninformed, they didn't have access to the information or they just hadn't gone out of their way to um, receive that access to the information. And a, another portion felt unrepresented, felt that their stories weren't um, represented in the history, um, which is understandable as the community has been a very diverse community to, since the 1960s. Um, the gay community really, um, felt at home in this place. And in the 60s and 70s, they really made it their own. And that has really kind of shined through through the decades now, because as you will see in the next um, slide, a lot of the um, reason that people came here was for the diversity. Beyond the historic architecture, the central location and the vibrant community, the vibrant community is really fueled by diversity and the historic architecture. Um, a lot of people said the central location, but I also had some people that um, kind of focused that, or said that they felt that the 
Central location didn't play a super big role because they were kind of cut off from the other neighborhoods due to the one-way streets and kind of the layout of the city. Um, it kind of created its own little um, home inside. So you have University of Louisville on the south side. You have downtown, which is a little separated um, on the north side, and then interstates flanking on the east and west. So there's kind of a little bit of a separation from the rest of Louisville, um, but within this community has really developed itself. Um, some other the reasons that people came to the area were the tree canopy, um, one person said floral terrace specifically. Um, some people said the walkability or the affordability. So, Another question I asked was the impact of Central Park on, that the community ha has on the community. Um, so obviously you can see it has a pretty significant impact. Um, some of the, the things people talked about in the um, written part of the survey were Shakespeare in the Park, um, Halloween on Floral Terrace, which is just off of um, the Central Park, um, Spring Fest, and then also St. James Art Show, which is within Central Park and along St. James Court. Um, other, you know, elements of Central Park are kind of brought through the community and allow people to have a central area to gather and, um, you know, commune. Um, and this has been kind of common throughout the years. So, Back in the 1800s, they would have Easter parades around the park and um, the kind of other elements, like I mentioned before, the Shakespeare in the park that started way before our Shakespeare in the park um, and other elements like that. So this um, area of the community is really essential. Um, but a lot of people kind of mentioned that it's not well taken care of by the city. Um, and that's something that they would like to see change. So as kind of we move forward, um, kind of talk about a little bit um, of what we can do as community members and to kind of improve the community life within. Um, like I said, a lot of people said that Central Park was undertaken care of. Some people said that um, the city didn't um, bring initiatives like it used to. But I would like to bring attention to um, one speaker or one lady that I had a conversation with. Her name was Deborah Harlan. Um, and she was a heavy activist during the 1970s and early 80s. Um, and she told me stories about her working with Mayor Harvey Sloan of the time and really going out to homes and literally standing in front of them to keep them from being torn down, working with the mayor's office to get initiatives pushed through. Um, this lady was actually deputized so that she could go and slap a note on someone's door and tell them to stop what they were doing as soon as they um, started. And it really goes to show that this community, while it is still preserving itself, it has kind of stopped doing a lot of the things that the initial grassroots movement were, um, were standing for. Um, one of the things that Debbie said was the community used government as a helpmate. The movement was grassroots up, not government down. It really did have to be um, people of the community working together to um, make those changes and uphold their structures and really um, push the government to do the things that they needed them to do. Um, so I kind of, I guess, want to give a call to action to really um, push members of the community and even outside of the old Louisville community, members of, of Louisville, the greater Louisville community to kind of push your um, legislators to, you know, work on Central Park and other parks on the West End and, um, you know, get involved in the neighborhood associations, work together amongst them and um, find out ways that you can, um, you know, be like Debbie Harlan and go stand on a doorstep and, um, 
prevent buildings from being torn down and um, make sure that the design law or um, bylaws are upheld. <clears throat> so that's kind of um, a little bit about what I have. I would like to share a couple other stories of um, people that I met with throughout the um, survey process or heard from throughout the survey process. Um, several of the stories I heard were um, about um, Friday night dinners in the neighborhood, people, you know, gathering just to um, get to meet one another and develop those community relationships. These communities don't have to be just about the architecture. They have to be thriving to sustain the architecture because buildings with no life no longer live. They really have to um, have people within them that are giving them the life that they need. Um, a few other things that people brought up as things that they enjoyed in the neighborhood um, or um, aspects that brought it together were um, Old Louisville Book Club or um, you know, meeting neighbors at the Old Louisville Distillery. So these are kind of similar to, there were book clubs in the 1800s. There were euchre clubs in the 1800s that I read about. Um, a lot of interesting elements that um, brought the community together and really showed that um, those walking courts and the proximity of the houses um, allowed these um, communities developed and it is really parallel to um, to the 1800s community despite the uh, the kind of flight from the area in the mid mid 1900s um, and it is interesting to me that the diversity um, has changed quite a bit because the original um, demographic of these people were wealthy white people that um, could afford to build a $7,000 mansion in the 1800s. Um, and a lot of these larger mansions are on 3rd and 4th Street um, and some of the smaller ones, but still huge buildings of the time. And not something that just anyone could build and purchase. Um, and now, after the depression and the movement to apartments, um, you really see a lot of diversity. You see um, people of color and um, people of the LGBTQ community. Um, one of the things that Debbie brought up was um, drag races that they'd have on the street, um, and, or not drag races, I'm sorry, drag shows, a little different. Um, and really just was a safe haven for the gay community. And I believe it still is. Um, while there's a little bit of a, a disinvestment um, kind of happening and a little um, lower level of preservation that's happening in this time, that is kind of due to the community. And we have to work together to really um, show those initiatives and show that we really care for our community and want to see it um, brought back to what it once was. Um, so with that, I guess we can move forward into any questions. Yes, so um, just want to remind everyone, uh, please go ahead and type your questions for Kate into the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and get to those. Um, so Kate, just to kind of start off, could, could you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in researching this subject? Yeah, so um, during my time at the University of Kentucky College of Design, I did a little bit of study in historic preservation and did my capstone research on the Over the Rhine area, um, which is a historic district in Cincinnati. So when I received the position and found out I would be doing um, a level of research. I really wanted to look into Louisville and kind of see how that compares to um, Cincinnati and um, the elements that they have, um, you know, kind of how those communities relate to each other, um, but really just kind of 
how those communities have progressed over time. It's kind of an, an area of um, research I've been interested in and I found a lot of um, different um, themes within the old Louisville area, but also very, um, I guess, more rewarding um, research. So in the area, um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, could you tell us uh, a little bit more, um, you, you mentioned over the Rhine, could you tell us about kind of comparisons, similarities and differences um, that you noticed between that community and what you saw here in Old Louisville? Yeah, so Old Louisville kind of um, saw disinvestment from its own community. I mean, people moved out of the area because they wanted to um, and or because of their own reasons and people moved back in because they saw interest in the area. Um, the Over the Rhine area is a quite different story. It um, saw a kind of, it was a German um, developed neighborhood and during anti-sentimentism after, or sorry, not anti-Germanic -German, sentiment um, after World War, the World Wars, um, that those German communities kind of started to infiltrate back into um, the rest of the community. Um, and that area laid abandoned for a while um, after they moved out. And then, um, then when the interstates were built through um, Cincinnati, the um, African-American neighborhoods that were living in those areas kind of were pushed into the over the Rhine area um, as a, you know, they, they got pushed out of their existing community and redeveloped their community within. And then now with vitalization, that community is kind of seeing themselves be pushed out again. So it's a very different story um, than in Old Louisville. It's very much Oval was kind of seen um, a different demographic, but not a forced demographic. So it's kind of a, a bit different story, a bit happier story, I believe here, um, and a community that really wants to be here and wants the city to recognize them as a community um, and has, you know, pushed themselves to do so, so. Great, thanks for elaborating on that a bit. Yeah. Um, we do have some questions coming in over the chat. Um, got a question from uh, Daniel Vivian. He asks, um, in your research, did you find examples of families who moved to the Southern Extension early on um, and still have a presence in Old Louisville? Um, he says, I can't help but wonder if there are examples of people um, who have maintained ties to the neighborhood generation after generation. I did try to find some, but unfortunately, it seems like most of those families did move out um, in the mid to early to mid 1900s. Um, I hadn't found any that were more than a couple generations old. There are multi generational families, but um, I didn't find any who had been there um, or whose family had been there since the very beginning, um, which I thought was kind of interesting and something that is a little different than other um, historic preservation areas in the country. Uh, looks like we have another question coming in um, from Megan Smith. Uh, she says, it's interesting how the technological change from gas to electric appliance appliances started um, the eclecticism of old Louisville. Um, she asked, were properties in good repair at the time of transition? I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah, um, I kind of, I guess I found out a little bit about this. I don't know um, a ton, but um, they were in good condition at the transition point. I mean, they were, they had only been around for 20, 30 years, so they weren't very old houses. Um, and the transition to electric lighting was not that significant of a change because you could just run um, electric wiring through the gas tubing. Um, and cut the gas off. But when electric appliances came in, the issues with running wiring throughout the entire house became a lot um, bigger of an issue and more of a um, financial investment than people were willing to put during the time because it began, started getting into the depression area. Um, so kind of that's when people started to move out into different places to get their modern house without having to completely re- 
redo their um, existing house. Sorry, I did. I see. I did miss a little part of Megan's question there. It looks like if she's also asking um, if uh, you know the properties being in possibly in good repair at the time of transition, if that maybe contributed to undistinguished old Louisville as being gentrification resistant. Um, I would honestly, I I believe that um, the early preservation initiatives are kind of what brought the gentrification resistance. Um, one of the things kind of in comparison to the over the Rhine area I saw was um, there was a lot of gentrification there. Um, the city efforts there are, you know, creating a beautiful neighborhood, but really pushing out um, the existing community. In Old Louisville, it seems like um, the early preservation has prevented a lot of um, empty lots and heavy infill development, um, you know, a vast need for, um, you know, apartments and, you know, there is a need for, um, you know, grocery stores and other, um, you know, community services in the area um, that could be improved. But um, with the preservation designation, I think that has kind of prevented, you know, developers from coming in and completely overhauling. Um, and really like those early initiatives have really been the factor that kept it from becoming a fully gentrified area. Great, uh, looks like we've got one more question coming in from uh, Patrick Lee Lucas. Um, he says he lives um, in a Lexington neighborhood um, that's that's kind of similar to old Louisville. Um, and uh, he says he was struck by your characterization of uh, another generation of residents beyond the early activists um, who helped with historic district designation and cheerleading to get people to live in Old Louisville. Um, and so I think he, he seems to be interested in um, getting residents to re-engage and wants you to talk a little bit more about, um, about that. Yeah, so of the residents I talked to that are kind of in that modern generation, um, the preservation kind of seems um, monetarily oriented, you know, revitalizing their properties to um, rent them out, and um, which is great. It, you know, it provides the preservation, but it's not the same as those early, um, you know, grassroots movement activists like Debbie Harlan, who were really making the efforts to um, preserve the area that was not wanted to be preserved. Um, kind of one of the things that Debbie said that kind of uh, struck me was that people would say, well, you live down there, as in referring to old bull, or why would you live down there kind of thing. Um, and her and the people around her in that community worked to make it where it was a desirable place to live. Students could live there and other, um, community members wanted to come into the area um, and really revitalize it in a way that protects the community. Um, I, I guess the organizations that exist today, um, while they're really, they are helping preserve what we still have, um, there's just not that grassroots movement anymore. And um, I guess, working together, really trying to build those relationships with the city and working to, um, you know, build relationships among the other um, preservation organizations in the area could really help um, that continuity throughout the neighborhood. Um, it seems that some areas have a really high level of preservation and desire to um, maintain their historic character in some areas. Um, just have less of that movement behind them. So I think kind of, you know, solidifying and um, working together more as a community could help with that a lot. Do you think some of the neighborhood associations kind of contribute to that, like a neighborhood association that has more activity, more active members? Um, do you kind of see uh, that area more interested in historic preservation? Yeah. I saw a lot of responses and a lot of activity um, to my survey from the Floral Terrace um, kind of neighborhood 
Association and um, that area of group of people. And those are beautiful homes. They all work together to maintain their walking court. Um, and you can really tell with how they responded and, um, you know, the way that they work together to, um, um, to, to maintain the beauty of their neighborhood, whereas in kind of other places on the edges of the um, of the district just kind of didn't get as much response from or um, they just kind of haven't seen as as significant a preservation throughout the years. Uh, looks like we've got another question coming in from Charles Cash. Um, he says, Old Louisville is a local, regional, and national treasure. Um, other than support from its residents, how can we promote this reality to a broader audience, increasing ownership, tourism, and value? That's that's an interesting question. Um, I guess, hmm. I mean, one of the things that kind of I heard about a lot was um, work with the local newspaper and the Courier, Courier Journal to um, express the activism that's taking place in the area and the preservation level um, and really showing Old Louisville is a preservation district that is kind of has been followed by a lot of others um, since it was such an early on. Um, it did see a lot of early attention. Um, so I think as that activism potentially comes back in, really working to have it publicized and have, um, you know, work with other news sources to um, show the efforts that are going in. That could really um, not only bring in further out a broader audience, but also could um, initiate more change from within. I mean, if if you, if you see in the newspaper that a bunch of your neighbors are working together to preserve this old building, you might um, want to get in on it. So um, really kind of working together to publicize those efforts, I think, would be a good way to um, promote what's going on um, and really improve and bring in more people to the area. So. Yeah, some, some local media involvement. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, I think. Mary Jackson wrote in, it looks like she just has a comment. Um, she just says, thanks for your presentation. Uh, she worked for our Jeffrey Points architect at Fifth and Oak for many years, um, and he was very involved with preservation. Um, and uh, they paid for college for their children through ownership of three rental houses in Old Louisville. Um, she really loves the area. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I have uh, another question for you. Um, so you just finished up your degree at UK. Um, you have uh, a certificate um, of historic preservation. Um, so how did that background and its experience with historic preservation um, impact your perspective on this project? Yeah, I would say that that perspective um, kind of provided me with like a grounding tool to um, compare the old Louisville neighborhood to other um, historic districts I'm aware of. Um, but additionally, just kind of having an understanding of how um, these preservation districts have impacted other communities and really kind of understanding what elements were um, truly because of the community and what might have just been um, a byproduct of another factor. Um, so that was kind of one of the elements. Another was just kind of understanding the architectural styles in the area and the significance of the area itself. Um, it is a very eclectic neighborhood and not one that you kind of see very often, especially in, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you get into the 50s and later 1900s, and even now, um, most neighborhoods are developed in a similar style. You know, you see ranch houses, or you see the now the cookie cutter suburban neighborhoods. Um, but that area has a whole collection of architect designed houses, of eclectic designs from 
Um, you see Richardson Romanesque, you see Italianette, you see Chateauesque, you see so many different um, elements. So it's really, I guess, given me the perspective to understand the beauty of the neighborhood and see it from um, a more professional level as opposed to just um, an admiration. Well, thank you so much. Um, it does look like that's all the questions that we have for you. Um, I did want to go ahead and close um, and by thanking uh, AIA CKC um, and the University of Kentucky. Um, Kate is our seventh student um, who's been sponsored by these groups. I'm really happy to have her here working with our architecture collections. Um, and as I wrap up, I did drop a couple links into the chat there. Um, Kate mentioned working um, with some digital architecture collections. Um, we have uh, been working to digitize some things. And so we do have uh, our Jasper Ward and Grossman Chapman Clare collections um, that you can see online. These are award-winning um, projects uh, honored by AIA group. Um, and then um, and there is also just a link to our um, uh, Omeka site where you can see many digital collections, including architecture collections. So um, I'd encourage you all to uh, take a look at those. Um, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.